Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be a part of, to be with my Fairview family, to celebrate all that God is doing, that we get to be a part of a movement of God that's transforming lives. And so, as mentioned, my name is Dan Bussey, lead pastor of Club. Been here about six months. I want to give you a quick snapshot so you know what sort of bald guy's talking to you this morning. Been married for almost 20 years. That'll happen in January. Been a part of pastor, been a part of ministry for a little longer than that. We do have four kids. They are four teenagers, and I love it. I can't imagine a more sweet spot in our life. It's just incredible to watch them, you know, take a, understand their own world and what God's doing. It's just a thrill to be a part of that. And so I did not grow up. Time out. It's red. You want to take it off the belt? Sing a little dance to a song. Test, test, test. Well, I don't know. I was into the whole welcome sinner. That's where I yelled out. <laughs> I didn't grow up going to church. I grew up in Washington State, and I totally lived for myself. I understood life to be all about what I could get out of it, which meant sports, which meant popularity, which meant girls. I had never heard of who Jesus is that he died on a cross that God sacrificed himself in love for me I'd never heard that message I didn't know what that meant I didn't have a clue growing up until high school when someone shared that with me and it changed everything God unlocked my heart and there was a hunger and so much changed in my life in high school and right before I went to college, I had a mentor of mine. We were out in the woods near some train tracks, and he said, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something that I hope you'll remember for years and years to come. And so we're standing on the train tracks. I know probably not the smartest thing, but whatever. And he said, imagine each railroad tie is a year of your life. And you're getting ready to go to college, and you will have the temptation to only think about one tie at a time, one year at a time. But I want to challenge you to think bigger, to think longer, to think with the end in mind. What would your life look like today and tomorrow for the next couple years if you thought about the next 20 years, the next 40 years? What would your life look like if we had a vision that wasn't just what's right in front of us, but our lifetime, the impact that we can have throughout our lifetime because we have a bigger, bolder vision of decades, not just days in front of us. And that's what I believe Jesus is challenging us with today in Matthew chapter 25. You can open your Bibles. There'll be the words on the screen or click an app if you do it that way. It's a familiar parable, probably not one that's spoken a lot in church, but it is a familiar parable about opportunity and loss, about what can be and what we might miss out on. It is ultimately a story of choice. The choice of courageous living, living all in, embracing what God's called us to and has for us, or a story of fearful shrinking, of missing out. We see the text start with these words, For it will be like a man going away on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one talent, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. You notice that word like? Jesus is teaching us what it is like to live in the kingdom. That we have a king, we have a master, and he has a kingdom, and it's hard to understand that intangible concept, so he shares a couple parables. And he's teaching us about what it's like to live today in a kingdom that is not yet fully manifested. He's given each one of us an opportunity but what will we do with that? What will we show with that? 
Did you notice how much he's entrusted to each servant? To each one of these servants, he gave and he entrusted something very significant. A talent is not some sort of gift that you have today. It's not that you can sing like they did or you can dance. I can't do either. A talent was a measurement of weight. And it was about 75 pounds. And so if this is silver, which was the common use of money, then this would have been one talent. The one talent bag would have been worth a lot. Just take a guess. How much do you think it would be worth? Keep going. Keep going. It's more. 75 pounds of silver back then. How much do you think it was worth? It was worth 16 and a half years wages. So whatever you make a year, multiply that by 16, and that's what was entrusted just with one talent to this one servant. And it was according to each person's ability. And when we see that, if you're honest, we kind of struggle with that, don't we? You and I can have a hard time that someone got something that we didn't get. Anyone just want to be honest with that, that over your years... I love engagement. I love people raising their hands. Any of you ever struggled that somebody got something you didn't get? I mean, hello, you're all five-year-olds and your sister got a lollipop, right? And I think that's one of the things that keeps us from God's opportunity for us. It's comparison. Don't we just walk into a room and compare? We walk into a social situation, we look around, we assess, and we make some judgments about what's going on. We walk into a room and we compare, and a lot of times we judge, was it fair? And not only that, we have this thing called social media, insta face tweet gram, if you know what I'm saying, and it's hard. It makes us even more discouraged and disappointed because if you're on social media, you see this moment crafted, filtered, picture taken, and posted for all to go, like, love, awesome. But you know what's happening? It was only that moment that the kids were behaving. It was only that moment after you spent how much money at Disney World. It was only that moment after you threatened them or bribed them that everybody looked perfect. Click. And as soon as that click was done, it all goes back to chaos, right? And so we live in a society of comparison and discontentment, and it robs us of our God-given opportunity. We end up focusing on other people and start asking questions like, why did he? How come she? If I had that, I would have done even more. We can be guilty of looking down on those who have more than us with envy and looking down on those with less negatively. It's our culture and it's stirred us up in a way that I think is hurting us deeply. See, you and I, you have been given an incredible talent bag by the king, by the lover of your soul. He has chosen you specifically, empowered you, and gifted you, if you're a follower of Jesus, with something incredible made special and exactly for you. And so don't stick your nose in someone else's talent bag. Don't stick your nose in someone else's talent bag. It's not going to satisfy, and it's going to rob you of the opportunities God has for you. I believe there's another issue that keeps people from the God opportunities in this parable, and I want you to see it next. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. He knew who, he knew who it was, and he decided to dig a hole. And again, imagine this is 75 pounds, a huge bag of silver. That took a lot of effort and a lot of intention just to bury it. Verse 25, after the master's come and settles account, he gives this rationale. I was, what's the text say? Afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. What causes this? It's fear, right? What causes us to miss out on opportunities to embrace an active faith and live courageously? It's fear. Fear robs us. You recognize that we, that fear sells stuff, right? 
you recognize that there's this whole spin on marketing that says you will be safer, you will be more secure, you will be more happy. If you don't have our product, you're missing out. Fear sells us so much stuff. Angst is the air we breathe. Worry is the wonderland we like to play in. We fear so many things in this life. We fear being sued. We fear finishing last. We fear missed opportunities and a wasted life. We fear going broke. We fear being alone and being rejected. And we fear the sound of the clock as it ticks us closer to the grave. But do you understand that fear is a liar? Fear is a deceiver? Fear makes problems feel larger, doesn't it? Have you ever noticed that? There's an issue that you're confronted with and you start to fear and it kicks your emotions into high gear and you're like, oh no, I don't know how that's gonna, I'm ever gonna, ah! We had a house in Illinois that we were trying to sell after we moved here two weeks before closing. It fell through. There's a lot of fear. What's gonna happen? There was another buyer and there was these problems in the negotiation. More fear that it's going to fall through because fear deceives us into believing that the problem presented to us is bigger than it really is. And when we feel like we can't overcome it, when we feel like it's insurmountable, we start getting discouraged, don't we? We start shaking at the knees. We start losing hope. We start saying, I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't think it's possible. Because fear taints the way we see things, how we understand things. And so often we end up grumbling and griping and complaining because of fear. And honestly, in fear, we may even give up and blame God just like this servant did. Again, take a look, for it will be like a man going on a journey. So God's come, he gives us the talent, he gives us the opportunity, and he leaves. He called his servants and he entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one talent, to each according to his ability. And so my question is, what has been entrusted to you? What has been entrusted to you? to your precious care by the king. Your kids, your grandkids, your retirement, your neighbors, the people you work with. What is it that God has entrusted to you that only you can fulfill and make a difference with? Because our view of God will determine the choices we make. Isn't that true? Our view of God will determine the choices we make. I want you to notice right there, there's a stained glass window, the bottom left. Thou art king. I mean, I think we live in a world where we're living for the empire instead of the king. We're living for the driving forces of our satisfaction instead of finding satisfaction with the king. I don't think we live with an understanding of the kingdom that God has for us to find fulfillment in. I mean, we have the sign. We have the heart. Thou art my king. Let me serve you. Our view of God will determine the choices we make. And so that's my challenge for us this morning. That's my challenge for you today, that you have the courage to expand the vision that you and I would step into what God has called you and us uniquely to, and we would have the courage to expand the vision of what can be, what God's calling us to be, to live, and to embrace. So I love mountains. Any of you love mountains? I mean, so don't, I, somebody told me earlier, you know, we got mountains in Virginia. I'm not trying to diminish your nice little hilly capped, you know, little, nice little tree capped mountains. I'm going to go on Skyline Drive when the trees are turning. I'm looking forward to it. But when I say mountains, mountains aren't round. Mountains are triangles. Mountains have this wonderful white thing called snow. And yes, you get to go skiing. I can't wait to go skiing. But we're talking about the Rockies. We're talking about Alaska. We're talking about mountains, Gandalf. And I love ocean. I love 
ocean so much. The sound, the power, the waves, the crashing, the surfing, and the salt. I mean, every one of us needs vitamin C, right? S-E-A, vitamin C. I've lived in the Midwest, and there were people who never saw... I know, yeah, exactly. There were people who never saw mountains, and there were people who never saw ocean. And if you love mountains and you love ocean, maybe you've had the opportunity to go with somebody who's never seen it before. You know what I'm talking about? The moment they see the snow cap, The moment they hear the surf crash. Oh, I dreamed of it. I thought about it. I've watched videos. I've seen pictures. But being here in the presence, it completely changes the conversation. See, that's what I believe Jesus is teaching us about his kingdom. Do we have a right view and a big enough view instead of just our own understanding God's calling of what is great and what is to come. And so I think for us to embrace that, for us to see that happen in our lifetime, we have to have the courage to make three critical shifts. For the rest of the time, I'll do this quickly, but I want to challenge us with three critical shifts. The first is this, the courage to grow from informing to spiritually transforming that we would have courage to shift from informing to spiritually transforming. Again, take a look at the text. He who also had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I, what's the text? Knew. I knew about you. I heard about you. I thought I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and I hid the talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. He knew about him, but he did not know him. See, the, cons- the servant considered his master unjust. And so he didn't trust. Something in this servant's perception was fueling his understanding of the master. And I think the same thing can be said about us. What voices are we listening to? What's informing our understanding of life? What's informing our understanding of what matters, who God is, his character, that he is master and he has a mission? What voices are we listening to? Because those will start to determine what we understand and how we live. I've said this many times in my life, but if I could get you to be honest with me and tell me two things, what do you think about and what do you love, and tell you what your life's going to be like. What do you think about and what do you love? I can tell you what's going to happen in your life. And so I want to challenge us. The Word of God has been given to us to transform us and draw us closer to God. It is key to knowing God. But please, please be careful in defining your maturity by simply knowing more. I think this is one of the struggles we have in church nowadays. Now, don't mishear me. I don't want you to call Pastor Jim and say, what was that bald heretic saying? Let me be as clear as I possibly can be. God's word is critical for life and godliness. I don't want to take one thing away from the authority, the power, the fire, the life-changing transformation in the word of God, but I think we may just go to it to know about God instead of to know God more. I think so often we make this the ends instead of the means. Look how many studies I've done. Look how many workbooks are on my shelf. And we miss the life-transforming power of the Word of God. And we just filled our brains with facts and knowledge about God. Have we replaced intimacy with knowledge? Have we missed out on the voice of God and only know more and more about God. Because the way God's designed his truth is to affect our head that travels this six inches that is such a hard journey, right? I mean, if we're honest, it's easier to know than be transformed, but God's wired his word to transform our thinking so it transforms our heart and our living and it pours out through our hands and our lives. And that's why second, 
I think we need the courage to shift from programs to intentional purpose. Not just informing and spiritual transforming. Second, I think we have to have courage to shift from programs to intentional purpose. We live in a very busy culture. Anyone just want to go groan? You don't even have to, amen, you can just groan, right? We live in a busy, busy, crazy, go fast, go, go fast mode, rat race, get her done culture. And I think it's even worse around here. I get texts at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. People are answering my emails at 4 o'clock. I don't know, maybe they're on the VRE. I'm not sure what. But it is so dangerous and so much a trap in our culture of being busy, being busy. You know what I'm saying? We live in such a busy culture that gets valued. Our value is based on our production and effort. And so we almost worship activity and busyness as success. We're doing a lot, but is it effective? Is it the way God designed kingdom living? Where more lives are changed instead of us just being more exhausted. You know what I'm saying? There's a pace of life that you can go at it and at it and at it, and you're like, why isn't it making a difference? Because we're going for activity, but not life change. There's no real change the way God's designed it, and we're just more tired, more exhausted, and we hate that stupid alarm clock when it's going to go off tomorrow morning. See, I think far too often our relationship with God hinges on the hoops we think we have to jump through. That God loves me, God blesses me because I do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. I'm spinning so many plates that I'm exhausted. I come over here, I'm spinning this plate, and then I go to this plate, and then I go to this plate, and I'm like, that one's wobbling, but this one I haven't spun yet in a couple days, and we're schizophrenic for Jesus, and it's not changing our lives. You can clap, you can say amen, or you can go, whatever, you're nuts, bald dude. We end up measuring our Christianity by get there, do that, attend this. And I think we're missing the king's heart and the king's purpose. So can we be honest and ask, does this activity make a kingdom difference? Does this activity make kingdom difference. And so please hear me, in God's kingdom, just like more knowledge, activity isn't the same thing as maturity. Don't mark your maturity based on how much you know and how much you do. Understand, maturity is how much God's transforming you into the image of his son and how effective we're leveraging the resources of his kingdom for his glory. And here's the danger because so many churches have built their spiritual life on programs and studies. The pressure becomes to give people what they want, sacrificing what they need. The pressure becomes, give me more knowledge, give me more activities, and we're, we give people what they want and not what they need. I'll tell you, you have a born-on date, and you'll have an expiration date, you will breathe your last, and you will close your eyes. And if you've trusted Jesus, the next moment you will open your eyes and see Jesus face to face, and he will not say, wow, great job. Look how busy you were. Look how much you did. If it wasn't to glorify him as a growing disciple who makes disciples. Anything we do that isn't to glorify him as a growing disciple that makes disciples won't matter for eternity. And so as we see in our story, the two who were given the, the five talents and the two talents, they invested it strategically in what matters most because they knew and were transformed by their master. They understood what was given to them and who he was. They had intentional purpose for maximum impact. And so let me ask you this. If you, today, tonight, were utterly certain, absolutely certain God was behind that calling of you to
to do that, what would you do? If without a shadow of a doubt, the most clarity in your life, this moment, I don't care if you are 90, 80, 101, I don't care if you're 20 or 30, but tonight God spoke to you in such a way that there was utter certainty that he was behind the calling he has on your life, what would that be? What would you do? What would be the thing that you would go all in for? You would leverage your retirement. You would sell your house if you had to move. You would do anything to be a part of it because God called you to it. What would it be? And what is your next best step to get there? See, the one talent guy had the same great opportunity as the two others to risk himself on behalf of his master, but he deliberately ignored it. He buried it. He missed it. And he excused it. And so that's why last, you and I, we must have courage to move from guarding to growing disciple makers, from guarding to growing disciple makers. I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. He thought if he just held on to it tightly enough, it would be enough, and he missed it. See, church, whatever you do, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. It's too precious and too great of a gift from the king. Don't waste your life. But please understand, you will reproduce who you are. You will reproduce who you are, what you love, and what you think about. There's another pain over here. What, she, what ye shall sow, ye shall reap. That's all we're saying this morning. Are we sowing big enough? Are we believing big enough? Are we sowing a life that will reap a kingdom eternal glorious harvest because you'll reproduce who you are and what actually matters to you. So, if we're only knowing and we're only going and we're simply guarding, we will not be a part of the kingdom of God transforming this community. I love football. Anyone else? I love football. I'm so glad it's back on. Seahawks are my team. And yes, I went through the 80s where they were terrible. So you don't have to tell me on the bandwagon. I might be for the Ravens. I haven't decided, but I'm so glad football's back on. I love it. And, but imagine tonight you tune on the TV and you're watching a football game, but instead of the scoreboard where touchdowns are six, Point afters are one, and field goals are three. Imagine if you're watching TV tonight and they use a completely different scoring system, like basketball. What? Or baseball. What is going on with this game? Or golf? You don't want a higher number, you want a lower number. Or swimming? How much time you use on the clock? What I'm saying is this. An expanded view of the kingdom understands God's scoreboard. An expanded view of the kingdom understands the right scoreboard. What matters and what it means to win so that we leverage how to make it happen best. What I and you are called to do. The transforming purpose of being a disciple. Wrapping up, let's see how the story concludes. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. You and I, we will have this moment in our life too. This is a parable of truth. We will stand before God. If you haven't read 1 Corinthians 3 in a while, read it today, read it this week. 1 Corinthians 3 is what do we do with the life we've been given as believers and what do we have to show for it? Because we will stand account before Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3, read it this week. I don't have time to go into it. But the same thing will happen. Short or long, we will stand 
stand before God and he will settle accounts with us of what we've done with our life. And after he who received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. Go ahead and flip to 21. The next verse. Because I want us to read 21 together. Because this is the promise for faithfulness. Can we read it together? His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Little thing, little faithfulness, each step planting the right seeds. You know, what's ironic is this guy had a lifetime worth of salary that he invested, and Jesus calls it a little thing, and we think it's a big thing. And so I want you to write this down. Here's the conclusion. The decisions we make today determine the stories we'll tell tomorrow. You see how that's true? The decisions we make today determine the stories we can tell tomorrow. See, here's what I know about you, about many of you. Right here on the street is a heritage. It has been a blessing again and again of God's favor for almost 100 years. And whether you've been a part of it for six months or 60 years, you've gotten to be a part of a kingdom movement right here through these doors, through these walls, into this community. It's a heritage. It's a blessing because you have been faithful in the little things and God wants to give you bigger things. You've been faithful in your endurance. Again, read Revelation 2 and 3. Faithful in your endurance in good times and bad, in changes. You have been faithful in your endurance. You've been faithful in your generosity. You've been faithful to give to a generous God and mimic him and show off him. You've been faithful in your legacy. Faithful in imparting hope and truth and a model into another generation and another generation and another generation. You have been faithful and I'm proud of you. Faithful in little, leading to stories, big God stories, leading to stories of risk, of God showing up, of churches planted, of leaders developed, and lives being changed. And can I just say thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Do you want more? Do you want more? Because I can guarantee you God's not a God of yesterday. God's not a God of, that was great back then. He's a God who continually says, are you willing to take your next step? Will you trust me? Do you want more of me? the courage to expand the vision of what can be. In my over 20 years of pastoral ministry, I've been at the hospital many, many, many times in the moments where someone is near death. Many times their health is failing and we pray and we ask for healing, but we know that that's not why. And here's what happens. Can I tell you what doesn't happen? In those moments of final reflection and final thoughts, final hours, final days, before the last breath, never once has someone said, Dan, could you get me my car keys? I just want to hold them one more time. Never once when someone's about to breathe their last breath of on this earth, has someone asked me, I just want you to bring me my house key because I've done so much remodel work and I'm so proud of it. On someone's deathbed, never once has they said, Pastor Dan, 
if you could do me this favor. Could you go home and grab all my awards and diplomas and everything people recognize me for? Not for once. But you know what I do get asked? Are they here? Is my son here? Is my family here? Have my grandkids come to visit? Because they want to know that their life made a difference. The other thing I get asked if they're being vulnerable and being reflective is, Dan, do you think it mattered? Do you think I made a difference? Do you think God's pleased? 